Okay, hello everyone. Um, I think people are still are still joining, but we're going to make a start on this webinar, Climate Visuals webinar, from images to film, research lessons and campaign insights. Uh, my name's Adam Corner, and I lead our Climate Visuals program at Climate Outreach and manage our research team. And I am very pleased to to welcome everyone uh, to this to this webinar, and. Taking a look at this map, which we produced earlier, it shows that we've got a, a really astonishingly global audience for this topic, people who are interested in this theme. Um, I guess not every single person will be joining us live for the webinar, but everyone will be receiving the recording afterwards. And that is quite some geographical spread um, interested in this theme and these topics. <clears throat> it's also worth saying, I think, that the, the mixture of people on the call um, ranges from kind of campaigners and strategists to digital storytellers, filmmakers, um, academics, people working on policy, people working on communications. So um, welcome to you all and I will introduce our uh, speakers shortly as well as give a little bit of introduction to the, the, the webinar and the Climate Visuals programme itself. Um, before I do though, uh, just a, a couple of practical notes. So uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear and hopefully you'll be able to hear all of our, all of our speakers as well. Um, bear with us um, if, 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 if you can't. We are going to be showing quite a few different videos. Um, so we hope it all runs smoothly, but there's a few, a few changes um, to navigate throughout the webinar. If you can't hear us or you have any technical issues or anything like that, then you can message us on Twitter. So that's at Climate Visuals. Um, or there is a box that you can click on the bottom of the Zoom uh, interface, um, which is a chat box, and you can send a message to Climate Outreach, the host. Um, and if you send a message to just the host, then um, my colleague Eva Chapman um, will receive that message. And if we can help with any technical inquiries, we will. We may not be able to, but we will try. Um, more optimistically, uh, there is a Q&A box. Again, it's at the bottom of the Zoom screen if you click the Q&A button uh, a little Q&A box opens up and in that box you can type questions for the speakers so um, when you're listening to the three speakers that we have today please do type any questions you have into that box and I'll be able to pick those up and then once we've heard from all of our speakers um, I will select some from from that box uh, and, and and put them to our, our speakers which will, will serve as the as the Q&A session at the end um, so we'll, we'll hear from our speakers and there should hopefully be around about around about 20 minutes for questions at the end. Before I introduce our speakers, though, uh, I just want to say a few words about the, the, the climate visuals program. So this is this is the first in a series of events where we're going to be thinking about how our climate visuals principles um, sort of signposts to a more compelling, more effective visual language on climate change might apply um, to film and video and also provide a, a platform for people who are thinking and working with video and film on climate change communication. But our, our climate visuals program um, began life, I guess, a couple of years ago in response to a, a sort of simple but 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 on, on another way of thinking about it, very, very challenging question or, 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 or issue, which is that climate change has uh, something of an image problem in the sense that the images that define climate change in the public mind um, that you find in many NGO campaigns that fill up the image libraries of major photo agencies um, tend to be the same old uh, cliched, narrow uh, visual visual iconography that we've seen many, many times. Um, so it might be polar bears, it might be melting ice, it might be smokestacks, it could even be arrays of solar panels or wind turbines, but without any people in them. Um, and this, this 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 challenge of they're tending to, to, to not be very much in the way of easily relatable human stories um, as part of the, the iconography of climate change is, is something that, that Climate Visuals was designed to address. So we carried out some research um, with more than 3,000 people in, in three countries. Um, we tested a whole stack of different images. We came up with a set of principles, you can see them on the screen here, um, which point towards a more compelling visual language on climate change, more diverse, more human focused visual language. Um, 
but what we also did um, was create a, a website, climatevisuals.org, and, and do take a look if you haven't had a look already, which is an evidence-based image library. So it's full of uh, more than 500, 600 images now, which really illustrate and bring to life the findings of our climate visuals research. So if we're recommending um, to show uh, relatable everyday human stories, then there are images in there that illustrate that point. If we're saying you need to show causes of climate change at scale, then there are images in there that illustrate that point. Um, so take a look. There's, there's, there's hundreds of images to, to, to look through and um, it's, I hope, a, a, a really useful resource for more effectively using imagery to communicate about climate change. Um, but a question that we get asked um, fairly often is what, what about video? What about film? Um, can, you, can you tell us anything about how to effectively use video, moving images and film in climate change communication? Um, and that's really what this webinar and the series of events that we're hosting this year is about. It's about us asking to the extent, the extent to which uh, the ideas that we're thinking about with static images can be applied to, to video and film, but also providing a, a platform for a, a range of different speakers um, and thinkers to talk about the work that they've been doing, research and practice, um, using video and film to communicate climate change. So, uh, with, without further ado, uh, I will introduce our first speaker. Um, and our first speaker is uh, Bienvenido Leon Anguiano. And uh, Bienvenido is Associate Professor of uh, Television Production and Science Journalism at the University of Navarra in Spain. Now, uh, Bienvenido's work has focused on looking at how a range of different scientific topics are communicated um, through online video. Um, so he's looked at how not only climate change, but also nanotechnologies, other scientific issues um, have been communicated in this way. Um, and he's written a, a book titled Communicating Science and Technology Through Online Video, um, which includes a chapter specifically uh, on uh, 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 how climate change videos are uh, framed. Um, and I will pass over the screen at this point to uh, Bienvenido, who will start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. And also, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, let me share the uh, presentation. Okay. Oh, here it is, presentation, yeah. Okay, um, today I'd like to share some ideas about uh, a book just published. It's uh, a book I had the pleasure to co-edit with my colleague, Michael Burke, and comes from, this book comes from uh, our research that we conducted for the last uh, three years. It's quite an international group, a big group of, of people doing this, this research. We were 15 researchers from five countries in nine universities. What was the idea of the research? We wanted to study the, uh, the use of online video for science and technology communication. We wanted to take a very comprehensive approach, uh, studying how this is produced, what is the actual content, and also what is the effect in the audience, some reception studies. Uh, the book has a lot of information. Uh, obviously, here I will be only sharing a few uh, headlines to give you an idea of some of the results. But we, we, studied, we decided to study three different topics. Uh, first one is climate change, then vaccines, and also nanotechnology. We chose these subjects because they were uh, we thought they were very relevant, and also because they were uh, offered a wide range of different topics that could also help us to understand uh, online video, how it is communicated in different, uh, different topics. First of all, let me just mention one of the uh, data that motivated us to uh, do this research. Online video is, uh, as you probably are aware of, um, rising very quickly. At the moment, it's over 70% of all the data traffic in the internet. So to say it briefly, it's a tool that 
science cannot miss. I mean, it's necessary for science and for climate change to use video because it's, it's there. It's, it, everybody's using it. Um, one of the things we did was to ask experts, to interview experts, to see what they thought of what would be, a bit, a bit, I mean, what would be the characteristics of effective uh, science videos. And they said many things, but here are some, uh, only three ideas that may be helpful for uh, some of those of you who want to, uh, who are actually doing, producing um, climate change videos. They are saying, first of all, that we should focus on audience needs and expectations. In other words, we shouldn't be doing videos on climate change from the point of view of science for its own sake. That doesn't really uh, seem to work. This is not really nothing, anything new at all. Um, there are some research conducted by the BBC in the 1990s for um, television documentaries that are pointing to the same, the same, exactly the same direction. But this is still alive in online video. Then it's good to try to choose those topics that are fascinating, fascinating by themselves, and also that are connected to uh, daily life. This connection is also very important. We need to take climate change to that position where people can relate to. This also connects very well with the, with the principles that Adam was mentioning at the beginning of this session. Uh, and then it should be brief because people don't stay long watching only videos. Um, they should be also very attractive and not too complicated, something which is easy, easy to watch. Something we did as well in this research was to uh, classify the different formats that we found in online science videos. Specifically for climate change, we found 18 different formats. Uh, many of them come from television, and about half of them come, I mean, have been specifically designed for the web. And actually, the, uh, you see in this chart, it's quite split. There is no clear, um, you know, king of the formats, because there are so many different formats, uh, and it's quite well distributed. My, uh, well, some of them are very innovative, but some others are more a replication of the, uh, what we see on television, nothing new. So my suggestion for this would be, uh, first of all, try to choose that format which is best for the kind of uh, content you're trying to communicate. I mean, some of them, some formats are good for one content, some others are better for the other one. You need to choose the right one. There, there are so many. And then, if possible, try to find an innovative uh, format, something which is new, something that the audience can think, well, this is new, I haven't seen it before. It's not more, it's more of the same. And then, uh, when we see uh, one of those examples that I, that I think is uh, quite innovative, but good uh, in a minute, a video blog. But then also, it's very important to uh, distinguish between those videos that are produced and mainly intended to be watched on smartphones or on computers, because smartphones are right now the device that is used by more than half of the people to watch videos online. Um, let me show you first an example of this, uh, just a little bit, just a minute of this video blog. Dear future generations, I think I speak for the rest of us when I say, sorry. Sorry we left you with our mess of a planet. Sorry that we were too caught up in our own doings to do something. Sorry we listened to people who made excuses to do nothing. I hope you forgive us. We just didn't realize how special the earth was, like a marriage gone wrong. We didn't know what we had until it was gone. For example, I'm guessing you probably know it as the Amazon desert, right? Well, believe it or not, it was once called the Amazon rainforest and there were billions of trees there, all of them gorgeous and, oh, you don't know much about trees, do you? Well, let me tell you, trees are amazing. I mean, we literally breathe the air. They are creating, they clean up our pollution. Our well, I'm sorry I have to get this. We don't, we don't have a lot of time. But you can watch it on the internet uh, if you like. It's, it's a very good uh, example of blog. There are some, some, others, uh, some other very innovative uh, formats. Like the, some of this, what we call the web feature. 
that this, uh, this one is produced, uh, I believe it's produced by the Guardian. It explained in a uh, very uh, basic uh, way, very simple way, why should we care about climate change? Then mentioned that we should decide in advance where do we are, are we planning? Uh, with which uh, device we think people will watch our video. This is an example of a video designed for uh, mobile phones to be watched on Facebook, particularly on mobile phones. It's a platform called Playground Magazine. Um, that has been very, very successful in uh, communicating through online in social media. So what is the difference? Um, mainly it's their videos which have a very, very, very uh, simple uh, message, very clear, very simple message. Um, some people watch also without earphones because people sometimes watch um, some people watch um, the uh, videos in any any situation they can do it. And mobile phones sometimes they don't have the earphones, so it's it's good to have those uh, captions uh, there. And also the format, as you can note, it, it's uh, the size format is one by one, not a sixteen by nine. Um, so it's good to decide in advance. Where do we want to get our audience? In which device? Also, we did some research on who are the producers, who are the main producers of climate change videos. And we found out that, as you see here in this chart, that over half of the videos are produced by either only media or television. In other words, mass media. Whereas the scientific institutions are producing very little of those videos. Um, the same goes for the uh, non-scientific institutions, uh, 15%. So in other words, I think, uh, to say it uh, briefly, I think NGOs and scientific institutions are not playing the role they could play in this arena of the only video. And of course, it would be very important that they play, they, they produce more videos, they play, um, you know, um, this game more intensively. Because, for example, if we think of the uh, rigor of the videos, it's, it's something we did uh, through a survey to experts. We selected some of the videos and we sent them to experts in each specific um, discipline. Um, well, we asked many different aspects of, of uh, rigor, but uh, to summarize, uh, the last question was, do you think this video has scientific rigor? Well, only 44% agree completely or strong in this proposition. Whereas, you know, quite a lot of them, of the experts, thought, well, they only partially agree or they don't agree at all, or they slightly agree. Which means there's a lot, a lot of concern about the rigor of the videos, of many of the videos in the, in the internet. That's why this scientific institution will play a very important role here, producing strong uh, videos from the scientific point of view. What about the, uh, the narrative? Because this is something we uh, analyze in quite a lot of detail. Um, here are some of the headlines. Only a few, very few of the videos are using the storytelling, only 4%. Although we know that this would be a very strong uh, way of communicating, it's not being used. Most of the videos are using the uh, explanatory um, narrative that doesn't really how people to engage. And then only 9% are using any kind, some type of uh, interactivity. Although the internet is supposed to be the, the place for, inter for interaction, to be one of the main values of the uh, of communication in the internet. Well, it's not being used, not yet, very, to very low level. And also many of the videos don't really have high protection values. Uh, just to quote some of what uh, some of my colleagues wrote in the book, there is a golden opportunity for producers to employ storytelling, engaging presenters, and sophisticated production techniques. I don't mean all the videos should be sophisticated, but of course there is room for that as well. So let's go a little bit to the framing of the, of the climate change videos. One of the things we analyzed is the controversy. Because as you know, controversy can be very, very uh, harmful. Uh, for the people, because sometimes uh, climate change is represented, represented as though there was a controversy within the scientific community uh, as to where there is a climate change or if this is caused by 
being scientific, uh, I mean by the uh, human beings, which of course there's not, you know, there's no real controversy in scientific community. But in our, in our sample, in our study, you know, quite a lot of the videos, 27%, are re still representing, representing this controversy. And then if you go to those videos produced by people, by normal people, which is called the user-generated content, then it's much higher. It's 60%. I mean, most of the videos produced by normal people still represent the controversy. Uh, but on the other side, those videos that have been produced by scientific institutions, only 5%. 5% uh, include the controversy or mention the controversy. Sometimes just to say that there's not real controversy. Um, that's why it's important to think that um, scientific institutions, uh, universities, uh, should play a more active role in this arena. What is the objective of the videos? Well, many of them are aimed for information. Quite a lot of them also are, are, are any for awareness. And then we have this, at the end of the bottom, we have these uh, other objectives, which, is, which are entertainment and infotainment. You know, infotainment is a mix of entertainment and information. This is quite relevant already, and it's, it seems to me that it's going to grow. So it's something we should consider um, very seriously. Do we need to make our videos entertaining? Do we have to be funny? Well, actually, uh, although this is the percentage of those videos which were, which main objective was entertainment or infotainment, almost half of the videos, actually 45% of the videos, contain some element of entertainment. Mm, through stories, using celebrities, through uh, engaging images, or using humor. Is this good or is it bad? Well, let's an example. We are a flexible and innovative species, and we have the capacity to adapt and modify our behavior. Now, we most certainly have to do so if we're to deal with climate change. It's the biggest challenge we have yet faced. The same thing that keeps the Earth warm, that keeps the Earth warm. CO2 may make the Earth too warm. The Earth too warm. It comes in heat. Methane, chloroform, carbon, water, vapor, and carbon dioxide. They all trap heat. Methane, chloroform, carbon, water, vapor, and carbon dioxide. They all trap heat. Methane, chloroform, carbon, water, vapor, and carbon dioxide. They all trap It is important that the world get together to face the problems which attack us as a unit. The evidence is clear. Sorry, we don't have more time. Uh, again, you can easily find this uh, in YouTube. But then, uh, we did a survey just to check what would be the effects of using infotainment for climate change communication. And we found out many ideas, but these are probably the main, two of the main headlines. Actually, there is an effect of using infotainment to communicate climate change because this process is perceived as less serious for the planet. So, you should be aware that this could have this effect. Uh, people who perceive, can perceive this as less serious. But on the other hand, we found out that people who had watched this uh, infotainment version perceive climate change as more serious for their own life. So they felt it closer. Proximity is working there. Um, I think, I think that using entertainment in videos for climate change or for any scientific video is a big topic. It's a matter of dose. If you inoculate the venom from a bee in your body, it can be good for your health. But if you are sick by a uh, hundred bees, then you will be dead. So I think it's, you know, sort of the same. Matter of dose. Too much, too many, uh, or too much uh, entertainment can be uh, harmful for people, but a little bit could be good. And then more about uh, framing of climate change, we also analyzed what were the uh, framing in terms of using uh, mainly the loss frame or the gain frame. Uh, the loss frame um, emphasized the negative effects uh, of the process, whereas the gain frame emphasizes the benefits of acting to address climate change. So uh, again, it's, it's quite uh, complicated. I mean, there's too much information, but these are some of the headlines. Uh, all I did is following very similar patterns 
frame patterns to those used by the media. So the lost frame prevails. Um, and then again, this gives an, an opportunity for producers to, to take advantage of this experience. We know this doesn't really work very, very well uh, to engage people. So why not making more videos, producing more videos that present uh, the positive approach uh, towards mitigation adaptation? I mean, just to, to end with, um, I think we are the most using online video to community climate change, um, not in the right way. I think we have a very sophisticated tool. We have this Ferrari that we could use, but we are using it really on the, at the pace of a donkey. Now, let me say that uh, I have nothing against donkeys. I love donkeys, <laughs> actually. I think they're lovely. But my point is, we could get a lot much more out of uh, this extraordinary tool, which is online video. So this is it. Thank you so much. Uh, we are happy to take any questions after at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Bienvenido. And uh, the questions are starting to come in for you already, actually. So there's a few in the Q&A box, and I'll take a look at them after our next speakers, um, asking about the sample size for the, for, for, for the video survey research and things like that. But keep them coming. And uh, I will now introduce our, our next speakers. And I'm very pleased to say that we, we have up next uh, Liz Bantz and, and, and Benjamin Drummond. Now, Liz um, is the, the, the vice president of an organization called Resource Media, which is a, a US-based uh, communications specialist. And I know, I know Liz's work from the, the excellent work that they've done specifically around visual communication and, and, and including climate change. Um, so Liz is the author of, of, a, of a great uh, guide called Seeing is Believing, a guide to visual storytelling best practices, um, and also manages the Visual Story Lab, um, which is uh, a website focused on sharing cutting edge approaches for issue oriented visual storytelling. So um, very well qualified uh, to be speaking on this uh, webinar. Then speaking, speaking with Liz is uh, Benjamin or Benj uh, Drummond and uh, with his partner, he's a, a, a documentary maker, filmmaker, um, he crafts stories about the natural world in the human age with a particular focus on, on making science personal. So a bit of a link there, I think, to the, to the last speaker as well. Um, and, and Ben has worked with a whole range of different NGOs, the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International. Um, has, his photography has appeared in a range of places, including the National Geographic, um, and his films have been exhibited um, at a range of, of, of different festivals and um, outlets as well. Um, so I will hand over to, to Liz and and Benj for a bit more of a focus on kind of uh, campaign practice on climate change communication through video and film. Great, Ed. thank you so much for inviting us, uh, Adam and the Climate Visuals team. And I have greatly, greatly enjoyed working with you all as tested climate visuals um, and shared best practices for moving people to action, which is what uh, Benj and I seek to do with our collaborations. And uh, Resource Media, as Adam said, we're a nonprofit communications firm. I'm based in Seattle, but uh, we have nine offices all over. And roughly 50% of our work is devoted to climate and energy issues. And uh, today, Benj and I will do a deep dive case study in one of our film collaborations on carbon pollution and ocean acidification. And we'll really uh, pick it apart to share with you six um, criteria or filters we use in creating climate videos that you can apply to any topic, any story you pursue there. And um, Adam, when he invited us, he asked us to answer this question of how do you create a climate video that people will watch until the very end? And as you know, uh, possibly from your own YouTube habits, uh, most people drop off videos after the first 20 seconds. So if you put sink money and time into it, how do you get people captivated to hear your message all the way to the end? So I'm going to ask uh, Benj to uh, give us the background on the film that he and Sarah produced. Hi there. So I'm just going to, as Liz said, kind of explain what we were tasked to do and how we went about it. And then we'll share that film and, and talk about it afterwards. So this story about crab actually started with a different story about oysters. 
Um, and about 10 years ago, um, oyster larvae started uh, dying dramatically in Pacific Northwest hatcheries. And the cause was ocean acidification, they eventually found out from upwelling waters off the coast of Oregon and Washington and British Columbia. And the oyster growers started scrambling to figure out how to control for pH within their hatcheries. And they started calling really loudly and vocally for, for more research funding. Um, for the team at, at Ocean Conservancy that advocates and lobbies on behalf of our oceans, um, they would characterize this as a, as a fishery engagement success story. But in fact, the oyster growers got so effective at, at making noise about ocean acidification that the Conservancy became concerned that ocean acidification was just becoming known as, a, as an oyster problem in the Northwest when really we're talking about a global crisis. Um, so the Ocean Conservancy came to us because they wanted to bring other vulnerable fisheries into the ocean acidification conversation because the science indicated that really the whole food web was potentially at risk. And the first fishery that they wanted to tackle this with was Dungeness crab. One of the great things about working with Liz and Ocean Conservancy is that they had very clear what we call GAM, and that's G-A-M for goals, audiences, and key messages. And whenever Sarah and I start um, a new project with a client, establishing these goals, audiences, and messages is, is the absolute key first step because they guide almost every decision that we make in the process, whether it's choosing characters, finding scenes to go film, or even the, the edit process and all the decisions that come downstream. And the goal in this case was to increase the amount of federal funding um, available for research and monitoring of ocean acidification. And the Conservancy really had two key audiences in this case. Um, one was crab fishermen and two was policymakers at both the state and federal levels. Um, and that's a different audience than everyone on the internet. It's, it's a very targeted specific audience. Um, and I think that is part of the key um, to why this was effective. We've definitely shared this with general audiences, but the, that was kind of the bycatch. That was the, the third priority. So in making this film, the, the first step on our end was finding the right fishermen. And we had a producer who um, knew the industry uh, interview about two dozen different Dungeness crab fishermen in Oregon and California. And they were working to find individuals who had credibility within the industry, were fishing at a, at a smaller scale um, so that they were somewhat vulnerable to, to any environmental changes that the fishery would experience. And, Essentially, they were also um, willing to take on a leadership role with this issue. And, and over the years that we've been doing this kind of work, we found that the, the process of, of collaborating with um, a, a character on a project like this is a really tremendously powerful way to, to cultivate their own ownership in the issue. And in fact, the two fishermen that you'll see in the film, John and Josh, um, three years after we finished this project, are still really engaged in helping get the word out um, about ocean acidification. Um, lastly, the, the other key component, of the, key component of this film was the state of the scientific research. Uh, when we shot this, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, was just about to publish new findings that linked um, changes in pH to lower Dungeness crab larval survival. And the film was completed and ready and able to tie into this new hook, news hook when that research was released. So this five minute film premiered at, at congressional and private briefings that the, the Conservancy set up in Washington DC. And then it has since gone and, and toured the festival circuit. Um, more recently, last year, we added a second film in the series looking at ocean acidification and coral reef dependent businesses in Florida. It follows the same model. So we're gonna share high hopes. Um, I'm gonna paste a link to it um, within the chat. And so you'll be able to find it directly that way if you have trouble with the video. Well, the first thing that impresses me about them is that they're really aggressive. And if they were four feet across, nobody would go swimming. You wouldn't go wading. They would grab you by the leg and drag you out. <laughs> They're that kind of aggressive.
if crabs were to disappear from the picture, I think it would be the end of my fishing career at this point. And I think that a lot of other fishermen on the West Coast would be in the same boat. I think you'd see a mass sort of die off of, of the fishing industry. The work on Dungeness crab kind of came about because we were looking at species that we felt uh, were particularly important uh, to the ecosystem and to people. Crab has become the, uh, if not the top player, the, the second to the top. There's really only two things I fish for anymore, black cod and crab. It has been the only lucrative fishery for the last, you know, eight or ten years. They're also really ecologically important because particularly the larvae, uh, which are planktonic, are prey uh, for a lot of fish species. So the work that's been done here on Dungeness Crab has really explored how ocean acidification might affect the early life stages and we're exposing them to conditions of today and conditions that we expect in the future, so what you can call almost an ocean time machine. We found little effect on hatching success uh, in this kind of first round of experiments, uh, but we did find that they have lower survival um, when they're reared in conditions with high CO2. Nobody has stopped on the dock to talk to me about ocean acidification. And they've stopped me and talked to me about just about everything else, you know. Uh, we could use a little more uh, information and education about it, I would say. So there are a lot of things about how ocean acidification might affect a Dungeness crab that we don't know. The amount that we don't know vastly exceeds what we do know. Yeah, what we're really excited to do this summer is kind of take our experiments the next step. And we're getting much more detailed in what we're measuring in terms of response to ocean acidification. We've kind of developed our societies and our kind of ecological systems with the marine ecology as it is right now. So any kind of profound shift in that is going to have big economic and cultural impacts. So, I mean, I'm trying to, you know, get my kid through college, and um, I'm a full-time single father, and, you know, it's like my whole life depends on there being a healthy crab fishery. Thank you, Benj. Um, uh, since that film, Benjamin uh, Drummond and I have uh, worked together with Sarah and uh, both domestic and international NGOs on several other films, as he mentioned, on uh, coral reef 
uh, impacts from climate change, as well as most recently uh, a film on, on blue carbon and solutions addressing climate change. And we have used these um, six questions to guide the filmmaking and the storytelling process each and every time. And we're gonna share that with you, just looking at this um, crab film. And so obviously here, there's a little play on, on the English uh, language with the hook at the beginning, because at the beginning of this video, you had this um, powerful combination of a close up of the crab, the claw, then you had the eye popping up, the crabber describing in the background how aggressive they are, and uh, Benj coupled that with very dramatic music. So it was a very unusual close-up. I had mentioned to you, most people drop off YouTube vis videos in the first 20 seconds. And the reason we really went with a surprise, sort of a grab you like you would do in a public uh, a speaking presentation is that there's research out of Stanford University that humans are biologically wired to be attuned to surprise. And I, I certainly jump a little each and every time I see the, the crab eye pop up, but climate videos are not any different than any other video in that you have to engage the viewer right off the bat, otherwise you lose them. And thinking about what you can do there, we want to just show there's just a wide, wide range of ways you can do that. Um, I want to talk about that in terms of virality because I think all of us have uh, in the communications business have received these calls from people saying, hi, I want you to make us a viral video. And we go, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, there is a a job at YouTube and that's the trends manager and they study every year what are the most viral videos on YouTube and have looked for trends and one of those elements that are a key to virality is this element of unexpectedness that you have something really unique creative unexpectedly delightful and um, as Bianvenito also mentioned humor and authenticity are, are really important, um, no more so than if you have a low production value film. They ride off of humor and authenticity. But uh, I showed you the, the screenshot here, uh, the screen grab from the baby crab dancing with the music in the middle of the video that we wanted with such a heavy topic to add in a little bit of, of fun so that we are not all uh, gloom and doom. And, and those of you listening today, we know the topic of climate change can feel very uh, gloom and doom. And a touch of humor in, in video is a really um, great bridge and, and almost a relief. So poke fun wherever you can. So the second question we had was, have you matched your main character, in this case, two characters to the audience? So it's this idea that your messenger whoever you are aiming the video at, that person has to have credibility or influence. Your audience should be able to relate to them in some way. And as Benj described, Ocean Conservancy had a US federal audience, Congress, um, that can allocate federal funding to ocean acidification research. And in the US culture, and this may be true of countries in which uh, you all live, fishermen as farmers of the sea are like, we always say like mom and apple pie. <laughs> In American culture, a politician would happily have their photo taken standing next to a fisherman. And if you know your politician wants to stand next to the character in your video and have their photo taken, that's the right person um, for your video. You'll notice there were two scientists in the film, and uh, this is important when Bianvenito talked about evidence-based uh, uh, work and, and marrying it together with storytelling. Uh, I would say fishermen, great main characters in this community that they feel firsthand the impacts of climate change on their jobs, on their prosperity, in this case in the not too distant future, Scientists like Shallon Bush here, she is extremely authoritative on ocean acidification in the US. She is one of the top scientists, but she has to stay a supporting character. 
And the reason is that she can validate the concerns and the threats, but Congress, our Congress is not giving funds, and many of you outside the US know, know our federal government today, they are not in favor of science funding currently. It's very, very difficult for scientists in the US. However, Congress will give funds to help the fishing industry, and therefore we had to put forward the people whose livelihoods and jobs were at stake and make them the main characters. So the third question is, uh, what emotions are you trying to generate? And the idea here is that the social science says emotions lead to action. If your audience does not feel emotions, they're probably that are very active emotions, they're not going to get off the couch. And um, with this climate video, I think a clue to what emotion we were trying to stoke is in the name of the film, High, High Hopes, which very conveniently also happened to be the name of the fishing vessel, as you see here. But um, Benj and our client, Ocean Conservancy and Resource Media, together we developed a creative brief for the video well in advance uh, of even finding these two crabbers, where we very consciously said we need a video if it's about something as overwhelming as climate change and its impacts on the oceans and fisheries, we have to leave the viewer still feeling empowered and hopeful at the end. And we know this, that from social science research about climate change, that what gives people a sense of agency when it comes to climate messaging, they have to have climate threats paired, coupled with solutions for people to avoid feeling overwhelmed, feeling paralyzed, or fatalistic about the problem. And, and Hope telegraphs that enough of us believe this is not an unsolvable problem. Fourth question is, do we come to understand the character's needs, and are these universally held values by your audience? Can What can that audience identify with? And given we had federal policymakers as our main audience, prosperity and jobs, even family was front and center in this video. And these are things that Congress people really care about. It's what they, what they campaign on. And fifth, the fifth of the six is that you need tension and conflict in a good narrative. We know this from the Hollywood movies we love to watch, the books we love, that um, in my world we talk about uh, having a little bit of tension, drama, suspense as the oxygen of the story. This is what keeps people watching until the very end. What is going to happen to Josh? What is going to happen to John? And um, here you have Josh Churchman, and he was talking in this clip of the film about depending on crabbing to get through the season because it was such a lucrative fishery. And John talked about being a single father, trying to raise his son on his own, hoping to put him through college. So there was a, a little bit of tension and anxiety for their future, and therefore they needed to know um, from the researchers. So um, will they fund ocean acidification research or not? So last, you saw that we had a message and a call to action at the end. And Ocean Conservancy, their team consistently incorporated this very same message in their video, in their news releases, on their website, uh, that Congress needed to support more research and monitoring of ocean acidification through federal funding. So here we have this, this flash three messages. We need science. We need answers. We need solutions. And when they showed this at a private briefing, and that's why this video was you know, five and a half minutes is that these were typically in closed door sessions rather than having a short two or three minute online uh, video as they then delivered a specific dollar ask in that briefing. And then of course you followed this with a URL for their ocean acidification program. So that was the magic formula um, for us. And now Adam is going to uh, take us through some of the questions that I've seen have been coming up. So I wanted to say thank you so much for um, being with us during this hour. 
Thank you very much, Liz and Benj, and and really fantastic, fantastic, inspiring work there. I think so. Lots to lots to chew over. I'm just going to pick out a a, a couple of the questions um, and maybe put a few together at once. So th th this is a kind of uh, a cluster of questions that I think are aimed at all all three speakers. Really, there was a question in the Q and A box around how do you how do you best measure impact of videos? Like what metrics are best? And I guess that's does depend on who your audience is, what you're doing, but um, it would be good to get some insights into that. And I think linked to that, how do we make sure that these videos where there isn't a very specific audience as there was with, with, with that, with that example, how do we ensure that if they're on social media, they're online, they're getting beyond the, the kind of usual suspects? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that in, because we are, um, probably two thirds of our funding is from foundations. When your grants, Adam knows this world, and they ask for um, this. And with the online world with videos, you can look at views, you can look at shares, you can look at very quantitative information. I, um, and, and no one at Resource Media believes that tells the whole story. And so we are um, very diligent about coupling quantitative data on video views with qualitative stories. And that means that we task our clients with um, writing that down, you know, after the congressional briefing, what were some of the anecdotes of the conversations, the reactions in the room from people watching it in person. And um, to us that really uh, tells the full story and the reason for this is um, from the cognitive sciences, which you know, in in the prof in our profession, um, social science and decision making and brain research has come front and center as the gift from the heavens. <laughs> and uh, what we know is that decision making it happens in the emotional region of the brain, and that is not a um, the front of the brain, it is not typically a rational decision and in politics especially, <laughs> very little of it is evidence-based rational thinking. Given that these are emotional decisions, you cannot capture all of the measurement and evaluation of the effect through quantitative. You really have to gather personal stories of why people were so moved to do something. Did you have anything to add to that, Bienvenido, about about measuring impact of videos? Because you obviously took a took one particular approach and you know asked for certain types of responses. Yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with what uh, you said. Uh, we have all those quantitative data, uh, all those metrics, which are very good to know, but they don't tell you everything. So uh, I think for that uh, we need more research because we can find a lot of uh, information doing research from the videos we have produced and see how they work, see how people, uh, what is the reception, what is the attitude of people, how do they, how do, how do these videos affect people, what they think, what they feel, what they watch them. So yeah, we need more research. Um, it's not easy to do, you need, uh, I mean, it's probably uh, it cost time, people, money, but we need to do more of that, for sure. Mm -hmm. And um, there were a couple of questions as well, Bienvenido, while, you, while you, you've got the microphone, which were just to kind of clarify, could you say a little bit more about the sample size on the, on, of the people, the perceptions of, 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 of your videos and the, and the countries that people were from that, that viewed the videos? Yeah, we selected uh, a sample of 900 videos, 300 on each of the three topics. Uh, the way we did it was just to, uh, on a specific day, we uh, typed um, climate change and then vaccines and then nanotechnology on Google videos. So those are the videos that the system gives back to you. In other words, those are the videos which have, which have a more, um, which have a higher uh, potential influence because they are the ones that the system is giving back to you. So we said to those 300 on each topic. Uh, and they, they, uh, they mainly belong to, uh, we share that in English because it's the uh, lingua franca in, um, in the internet. And then uh, they come from anywhere. They, come, they, they are uh, produced in so many different countries. But the, uh, the important thing is that they are those videos which have the highest potential influence in the viewer. Thanks. Um, there, was a, there was a point, I think, in, in, 
in, in both sets of presentations about, about the role of humour and entertainment. And I think Bienvenida, you were saying that it's about getting the dose right, um, you know, not, 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 not too much maybe. Um, and, and, and Liz, you kind of said it's, you know, you need to throw in some kind of contrast, some kind of um, juxtaposition with, uh, with the seriousness um, of the message. But I think, I think I'm right in saying that in Bienvenida's research, there was a, almost like a bit of a backfire effect in that it seemed to make people care a bit less about the, the, the bigger picture and to make people more focused on just their, their own role. So is there anything more you can say about getting that balance right, I guess, between pr projecting the big picture, um, but connecting with people, but without making it seem like it's just only relevant to them? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very important topic. We should uh, probably uh, do, again, do more research about how entertainment and humor is affecting uh, what people perceive. Humor is a, is a very important tool that you need to use in any kind of a story, storytelling. Uh, also for climate change, why not? But the thing is, how do you use it? You could use it in a way that makes people think that, uh, well, then this topic, climate change, should not be, must not be so serious. Or you can just mix it very well with the story, uh, just to make them, you know, relax. Humor has different purposes according to our rhetorics. And this is perfectly valid for a conference, for a lecture, or for a video. Uh, one of the main uh, roles of humor is to relax the spirit of the viewer. Okay, this is a very serious topic. You need to tell them many facts, a lot of science, very difficult, very difficult topics. But then, people cannot receive science all the time and learn everything. So give them a little, you know, let them breathe for a while, and then they will be ready to get more of the science. Yeah, that's a very important role of, of humor. You definitely need to use it. Uh, it's a very powerful uh, element in, in storytelling. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add, build on what you just said. When we look at, um, so Benj talked about our first priority was a congressional audience, but then the next wave was to get it farther out um, to the public to um, shore up our base and, and build out from there. And what we know about um, climate is, and I should say larger expression of self online. If you want people to share a video, people share online something that validates who they are to other people. And, uh, and in the corporate world, they talk about these people as brand ambassadors, that the brand reflects who they are. With climate videos, uh, people, it is similar to all other issue videos. Um, negative videos are shared far less than positive videos. Uh, videos with humor reflect people trying to be seen as a, a positive, funny person, the person you want to invite to the party. And uh, so we're very cognizant that, that that balance has to tip more positive. Humor is one of the easy ways to just insert a little bit of that. It's the same reason we share funny jokes online. We forward those, those around at such a high rate during the work day. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's a really interesting point about validating identity and it raises a whole host of questions about kind of political ideology and identity and, and, and climate campaign videos as well and the extent to which they're able to reflect not just the, 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 the kind of um, green bubble identity and beyond that. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm conscious of time, but I'm gonna, there's a few more questions come in. So maybe let's just hold for a few more minutes. Um, our, our friends at, at Climate Advocacy Lab have, have uh, are signaling their agreement with the idea that we shouldn't only look at the vir virality of um, videos as the kind of vanity metric because there's more to it than that, potentially. Um, there's a good question here about how video produces, and, and, so, and so maybe maybe this one could come to you, Benj. Um, go about responsibly balancing scientific credibility when story-based formats may primarily deal in the currency of emotion rather than facts and numbers. I mean, I think you were balancing it, but it, it does speak to that, that tension that, that Bienvenido identified as well, where only 4% of, of these scientific videos were using storytelling, which seems staggering, you know? Well, I mean, emotion is a great opportunity, right? I mean, that's, that's the beautiful thing about film and a lot of narrative-based storytelling formats is that you can um, elicit emotion both on audience side and then also on, on the character side. Um, when we go about making a film, I, I don't think we have any um, conception that we're trying to make our audience an expert on a topic. Our primary goal is to establish buy-in. 
And if, if like we can bring up the issue of ocean acidification, establish that there's a stakeholder who um, you may be sympathetic to, um, I think it's not our position to judge exactly what action pathway our audience should take to continue on that issue. Like there's a thousand different productive pathways that our audience may follow with an ocean acidification. Obviously those are different than if you're Joe Public than if you are a congressional representative for Florida or whatever, right? Those are all different. And so, so I think our job as storytellers is to um, capture a little bit of, of, of mind share on the audience and then set them loose to kind of follow the issue um, however they may be. I'm, I'm really reticent to like raise a climate change related issue and then just, you know, send out a simple, well, just to, you know, change your light bulb and, and, and then you're set. You know, I, I think that does the whole, whole um, problem a great big disservice. Like it's, it's really about finding ways that you can engage with the topic. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. And, and I, then I think we've done our job. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think as we're just over time, um, I'm going to call things to a close there. So I'm going to thank very much, uh, all of our speakers. I'm going to, I'm going to grab back control of the, of the screen too. Um, just for a, uh, final bit of information, um, which tells you, I can get it here. Uh, that if you're interested in um, knowing more about climate outreaches or climate visuals work, then you can sign up to our newsletter. Um, if you have any feedback about the, the webinar um, or any further questions that you want to ask, then fire them over to Eva, eva.chapman at climateoutreach.org. <laughs> we'll be sharing the link um, to, for the recording of the event. Um, so look out for that. And for the people that weren't able to um, join us today and our social media details are there as well. Um, so thank you very much everyone for um, joining wherever you were in the world and uh, with that I will draw the, draw the event to a close. Thank you.